Uh, thanks. So uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker today, Rosong Wang uh, from CMU. Uh, he's a uh, uh, fourth year PhD student uh, at CMU uh, working with uh, Roslyn and he received his uh, bachelor degree from Tsinghua University, the Yao class. Uh, he has a very broad interest in the theory and applications of modeling, uh, model machine learning and with a recent uh, research interest focusing on theoretical foundations of uh, reinforcement learning and deep learning. And uh, he has done many impressive works uh, on the theoretical nature of uh, offline and online reinforcement learning. So uh, I believe uh, the, uh, the audience of the seminar, uh, many of you are familiar with uh, you know, one or more of his works. And today he will be telling us about the statistical limits of offline RL with linear function approximation uh, which is a joint work with uh, Dean Foster and Shamka Gade. Okay, so without overdue, uh, Rosal, please take it away. Okay, um, yeah, thanks for the nice introduction and uh, thanks for coming to this talk. So yeah, so today I'm to going to talk about uh, like some of our recent work on the statistical limits of offline reinforced learning with uh, linear function approximation. And yeah, this is a joint work with Dean Foster and Shamka Gade. So yeah, so in, the, in these days, we have seen uh, lots of impressive applications of uh, reinforced learning. Like now we can use reinforced learning to play the game of Go, to play video games, and for self-driving self cars and controlling robots. So in the Euro like online reinforcement framework, um, the agent uh, interacts with an unknown environment modeled by a Markov decision process um, using policies. So yeah, so in each round, the agent chooses a policy pi, which is a function that maps states to actions. And by you know, executing this policy, you get a trajectory. And uh, yeah, so basically your data are, the, are those existing trajectories. And depending on this data, you choose the next, next policy to execute, which gives you another trajectory. And eventually the goal is to find a policy that maximizes the uh, community reward. Okay, so let me also set up a, set up a little bit of notations. So in this talk, um, uh, we define the V functions to be basically like from starting from state S, we use a policy pi, um, the expected cumulative discounted reward. And the state action function, the Q function is defined similar. Basically, you start from a state S, choose action A and follow policy pi. So basically that is the expected cumulative discounted reward. And you know, the goal, as I said, is to interact with the online, unknown environment in online manner to find a policy to maximize um, the value of the function starting from the initial state. Okay, so as we can see here, there are really two challenges in reinforcement learning, uh, in online reinforcement learning. The first one is like, you know, how should we collect data? Like, um, how should we decide which policy to use to collect directories? So this is the challenge of exploration. And also after getting this data, how, you know, how should we use this data to find a good policy. So this is the problem of exploitation. And yeah, so this offline reinforcement learning paradigms basically focuses on the second challenge of reinforcement learning. So basically like, you know, after getting this data, how should we use this data to do something? Okay, so in this case, um, the major assumption is like, we assume we have a static data set. Like you can no longer take new samples in online manner. This is all what we have. And you just want to work on this static data set. And the motivation here is like, you know, nowadays we have a huge amount of offline data available. And why don't we do something using this offline data? So yeah, this is uh, um, the motivation for study offline reinforced learning. And one motivating example here is like, let's suppose um, you work for a big company and you have huge amount of historical transaction data. You know, these are the log, uh, log interactions. And now you, one day maybe you come up a new trading policy and you want to know whether this new policy is uh, better than the old one. So we want to, um, yeah, use, uh, before deploying deploying this policy, you want to get a sense like what was the value of this policy, like using this historical transaction data. Okay, so this is really a problem about policy evaluation use offline data. The goal here is like we are given another policy and we want to evaluate this policy. So this is, as I said here, it's known as offline policy evaluation. And there could be other applications of this offline reinforcement paradigm like basically all existing deep reinforcement algorithms can be run in the offline mode. Um, you just uh, set the replay buffer to be the offline data 
And you can use this data to pre-train a reinforcement agent to warm start the algorithm so that the performance could be better when deploying uh, this algorithm in the online settings. And also this paradigm decouples the issue of exploration and exploitation. So no matter which exploration strategy you want to use, you can always combine that with your um, offline product, with the exploitation mechanism. Okay, so you know, in offline reinforcement, there could be different goals. One goal here is just uh, to policy violation. Like I gave you another policy. You have this static data set. You cannot take any new samples. I don't want you to tell me what the value of this policy. This is offline policy evaluation. And there could be another goal, like you just, uh, you know, you still have the data set, but now I want you to output a good policy. So this is offline policy optimization. And in this talk, I will be primarily focusing on the first question, basically the problem about um, offline policy evaluation. Okay, cool. So yeah, so, you know, before getting into the technical parts, let me ask first ask a very fundamental question about offline reinforcement. So what kinds of conditions should the data set to have so that we expect offline reinforcement to work? Like, you know, without any nice properties, offline reinforcement should not work. Like if the data set just contain like useless data, you know, we should not really um, hope anything to work. So there, you know, actually we could have two different kinds of conditions on the data set. Like one is coverage, the other is low distribution shift. Okay, so now, you know, as I said, we focus on offline policy evaluation. And the question here is like, what, which assumption makes more sense? Um, like, you know, which assumption we should make on the static data set for this offline policy evaluation problem. And, you know, to illustrate the difference of these two conditions, it's, you know, best to use some examples. So let's consider this uh, visual navigation task for which we want to control a robot in a house to reach a specific destination. So, you know, here the goal is to reach a um, potted plant, okay? And what would be a data set with low distribution shade for this um, task? Well, it's like some data set so that the data distribution is close to the, uh, to the distribution used by policy. So suppose this um, data set is used by another policy. It is really saying that for the policy I want to evaluate, it should be close to the policy that induces the data set. So this is what low distribution shape is talking about. But what would be a real life data set that could be used for this task? Um, there's actually some, you know, some empirical work on this topic. And there's like a real life data set people are using for this um, real navigation tasks. So this is uh, known as YouTube house tours data set. It, you know, these are basically, you know, uh, videos taken by um, real person you know, they want to showcase their house for the purpose of renting or setting. Okay, so you can see that you in this uh, data set, we do not really have low distribution shift. Like, you know, um, if there's some policy that is collecting this data, the policy is super different from the policy used in video navigation. Like the goal here is not to reach any specific location of the house as soon as possible. It's just like, you know, we want to cover all parts of this house. So, you know, clearly this data set satisfy coverage, like, you know, it covers the state actor space. I mean, it's it's not clear what sense it covers the state space, but, you know, at least, uh, you know, like intuitively it covers the state space, right? It covers the world of the underlying problem. So, yeah, so, you know, in re offline reinforced learning, we would like to be able to utilize a diverse source of data. So, you know, the point here is like offline reinforced learning, we expect it to work when the static data set has coverage. So, like, you know, low distribution shift condition could be problematic in offline reinforced learning because it's really hard to construct data sets so that, you know, it has, um, it is close to the policy you want to evaluate. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is like um, the difference between coverage and low distribution shift. And, uh, you know, in this talk, like the main question is like, you know, we want to understand what is um, the definition of a good reputation in offline reinforced learning. So, you know, it will be basically divided into two parts. But, you know, this talk will be divided into two parts. In the first part, we study like theoretical foundations, like, you know, what are the statistical limits of offline reinforced learning with good features? And in the second part, we ask the question like, you know, are features in practice really good enough? Okay, so yeah, so let's um, go to the first part. Um, we explore the theoretical foundations. Um, let me give you some intuition about this offline policy evaluation and also introduce the mathematical framework. So here um, we assume, yeah, as I said earlier, we assume we have a static data set. Like you can no longer take new samples, it is fixed. 
all you all you have with this static data set. Okay, and uh, each element here is a tuple, like the stand pairs um, sampled from the data distribution, uh, reward value sampled from the reward distribution, and the X prime, which is the transitive state. Okay, and you are also given another policy target policy. And the goal here is to use this given um, data set, D static data set, to estimate the value of this policy. Okay, so what would be um, like, you know, so what would be a natural algorithm here? So let's first think about the tablet setting where the number of set pairs is small. You know, in this case, a very simple algorithm is value iteration. Um, it's very simple, like we just have a bunch of iterations in this algorithm, and each iteration, we set the estimated Q value to be the reward value plus the discounted V value. And we set the V value, estimated V value just to be the corresponding estimated Q value. Okay. And what we can show that in the tablet setting, we all same pairs have sufficient number of samples, then we can you know, easily solve this problem. Basically the estimated value is pretty good. Like it's accurate up to our epsilon. So basically in the tablet setting, this is not so hard. But uh, you know, like you know, in practice, uh, these uh, problems never have small state space. And uh, so now the question is like, what happens if we have large or even continuous state space? Okay, so yeah, so indeed this is like a general problem in reinforced learning. Like you know, the way people tackle this question is by using functor approximation to encode our human prior on this text. So we want to kind of um, you know encode our human prior by you know designing a function class. So you know, you know, usually often reinforcement learning or reinforcement learning, we design a function class. So think this as like neural networks of a specific architecture, and we assume that you know Q functions or value functions can be approximated by functions in this class. Yeah. So you know, like we assume I have bounded compacted, and it could be like linear functions with respect to a given feature extractor, or kernels or neural networks. Okay. And uh, yeah. So in this talk, I will be focusing on the linear setting. We are, we assume that we have a feature extractor phi that maps state and pairs to d dimensional feature vectors. And here f is basically the linear functions with respect to this given feature extractor. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we want to know why there, you know, in this linear function approximation, what are the statistical limits of offline reinforced learning? Okay. So, you know, there are some very subtle issue about, um, like functor approximation. So basically, very important question here is like, if we use the linear function class, we see something like the Q functions can be approximated by um, linear functions of the feature extractor, which of functions are we talking about? So yeah, so um, uh, yeah, so like, uh, you know, like the natural assumption could be realizability assumption, which just assumes that uh, for the policy pi to be evaluated, the Q function is uh, linear. So this is really basically the minimum of the amount of assumption we can make, uh, or we can we can make uh, on the problem. But you know, I mean, in like you know, previous literature, a stronger assumption is usually make called a complete assumption, which says that for every linear function, I think this to be like a Q function, we apply the Bellman back operator, we get uh, another Q function, we assume that to be linear. So we can see that this complete assumption is stronger than the realizability assumption, but this is needed like basically in all periods of theoretical analysis. Okay, and uh, you know, the main difference between these assumptions is like, you know, no, the more Q functions you assume to be linear, this is actually assuming a stronger repetition power of the features. And you know, like for our theoreticians, we want to understand what is the minimum, minimum amount of assumptions we can make on the features so that things can work. Okay, so yeah, this is indeed the first question we study in this paper or in this talk. It's like, you know, are these stronger retention conditions like completeness uh, really necessary or like we can uh, avoid these assumptions? Okay, so yeah, so like, you know, let me first uh, talk about the easy case where there is only one step in this offline reinforcement problem, like basically the case where gamma equals zero. And in this case, what you have is basically like a one step reinforcement problem. You have a state of pairs, then you have the reward. So basically, this is like linear regression. But the main difference here is like, you know, when for policy evaluation, you want to know the, the values of certain pairs in the initial state distribution, but the data distribution could be different from the initial state distribution. So this is really a problem about linear regression, but with distribution shift. Okay, so, you know, when will uh, this like linear regression with distribution work, one set of assumptions 
is basically this courage assumption plus realizability assumptions. Let me um, introduce these assumptions. So this courage assumption is basically saying that let's look at the feature coarse metrics of the um, distribution. If this feature coarse metrics has lower bounded eigenvalue, and also suppose we assume that the Q function or basically the reward function is linear with respect to the given feature extractor, but what we can show is that you just run these squares um, and uh, you know, like you know, with polynomial number samples, we can get like a pretty good estimation. And in fact, it's something uh, very strong. It's saying like you know, for all certain pairs, we can estimate the corresponding Q function up to our epsilon. So this means like no matter which initial distribution you care about, the estimation is always good. Okay, so at least for the short horizon case where gamma is equal to zero, um, there's no big trouble. Like basically, uh, these squares will just work. So now the question is like, what happens with large state space and long planning horizon? You know, natural idea here is like, why don't we just combine these least squares with the evaluation algorithm uh, I said previous? So you know, um, you know, this is actually called uh, fitted generation in the literature of open reinforced learning. It's usually a combination of value iteration and linear regression. Um, so yeah, so you know, the algorithm is very simple. It's just like there are a bunch of iterations in this algorithm, and in each iteration, let's first look at the data points in the data set. And we said the estimated Q value to be the reward value plus the discounted V value from the previous iteration. So now we have the estimated Q value for you know, data points in the data set. Let's generalize this knowledge to the whole space. So what we can do is just like, let's just draw linear regression. Let's draw linear least squares to learn a linear function theta. And we just set uh, you know, the V function, estimated V function using this uh, learned linear function theta. Okay, and we keep doing this, um, hopefully until, you know, this will converge eventually. Okay, so this is indeed very simple and it is widely used in theoretical analysis. Um, so now the question is like, um, does this really work under just the realizability, uh, under the realizability assumption or we need some stronger uh, conditions? Okay, so um, to do this, I can actually, we can actually characterize the performance of FQI pretty easily. Um, so what we can show is like, you know, under realizability condition, there is an equality that characterizes uh, the estimation of FQ, FQI pretty well. So let me set up a little bit of notations here. Um, so here, phi is n by d matrix. N is the number of data points you have in the data set. Uh, each row is a feature. And you also have the next feature matrix, which is like, I call it phi bar. Um, uh, so like, you know, um, phi bar and like each row is the feature of S prime. And you also have the empirical feature across matrix, which is basically phi transpose uh, times phi. And okay, so given these notations, we can now calculate the estimation error of FQM pretty easily. It's like, you know, it, you know as I said, it's in quality. It's basically gamma to the t's power, where t is number of iterations um, uh, you run FQI times L to the t's power whereas L is some like metrics I will define shortly, times um, the initial estimation error, uh, which is theta zero minus theta star. Okay, and here L is uh, this um, the variant matrix is like basically the inverse of um, uh, sigma times phi transpose times phi bar. Okay, so now from this calculation, we can see something pretty interesting. Like uh, if this L matrix is non-expensive in the sense that taking powers of this matrix will not things exploding, then it's pretty nice. Basically, eventually the error will goes to um, zero, um, you know, by just taking t large enough. But what if there are some L matrix that is exploding? Basically, like you take powers of this L matrix and things will become super large. And we should see something like geometric error amplification. Okay, so you might ask like, you know, why does this uh, characterization is uh, very tight or like, you know, why does this geometric application could really occur? Um, so let me show you some very simple uh, simulation results. Like uh, here, number of data points is 100 or 200. Dimensionality of the features is 100, gamma is 0 0.99. And all the features and the underlying grid ground truth, basically theta star, the correct linear function, they are all sampled from a certain Gaussian distribution. And you know, like now we have the Q functions, we have 
uh, realizability, assuming, assuming realizability, we can basically define the reward values, basically using the difference of two Q functions. Um, you know, it's basically the what the reward value should be, and let's just use that to be the reward value. And this is actually a deterministic environment because I'm not really adding any noise to this reward value. And let's see what happens if you really run FQI on this su uh, super simple data set. And what well, you can see is like there would be geometric ramification. So, you know, notice that this is log scale and I'm plotting the estimation error of um, FQI. And also, as I said earlier, the estimation of FQI should be proportional to like some norm of the t power of the L matrix. I'm also plotting those matrices. And you can see that basically the norm of the powers of L matrices has basically the same growing trend as the estimation error. So this means that um, like, you know, at least uh, you know, in the linear setting, the previous comparison is pretty good, and it shows that geometric amplification could really occur even for simple data sets. Okay, so this is uh, you know like some simulation results. And another question you might be asking is like, when will this L matrix be non-expensive? Um, so I'm actually giving two conditions here. Actually, if you have continuous, basically the previous uh, you know the assumptions made in previous literatures, like basically saying that for every linear function, you apply the Bellman back operator, the resulting one is linear, then you can show that is like this condition implies some non-expensive property of the L matrix. Okay. Um, another possible condition is what I call extremely low distribution shift condition. I won't get into, into details here, but intuitively what they're saying is like the data distribution covers the distribution induced by the policy in a very strong sense, in a very spectrum sense. Um, so yeah, but you know, as I said earlier, this low distribution shift condition is really problematic condition in offline reinforced learning, because we would like offline reinforced learning to be able to exploit a large variety of data distributions. Um, question? Hey, Russell, I have a question. So we know that there is a so we know at least there is another case uh, where you know the FQI can still work. I'm not sure if it's captured in here. So this is the case where. Uh, it's a further special case of linear where you actually essentially have state aggregation, right? So in that case, we know error do not blow up. So, but that, that certainly, if I have that, I don't need completeness anymore. I just need realizability. So it's not in the second bullet. Would that fall into your third bullet or it's somewhere else? Oh, you're asking like the case, basically the features are like one hot feature. One hot, exactly. Yeah, I, I don't think it is covered by either the two cases, but in that case, like the L matrix should still be like non expensive because there's basically no geometric application at all. Exactly. In that exactly. Case. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Okay, cool. So, yeah, so like, um, so yeah, so, um, so now the question is like, you know, we showed that geometric application could be real, like, you know, it occurs even for very simple data sets. Like, you know, maybe it's just like we are not really, um, we are not really using the correct algorithms. There could be like smarter algorithms that solve these problems and kind of avoid geometric amplification. So yeah, is that the case? Or like, you know, there are some inherent issues for all possible offline reinforcement algorithms. And basically, um, yeah, here's our harness result. What we show is that under realizability, you cannot really avoid geometric amplification. And here in the harness result, we are assuming the strongest possible current assumption which basically says that you look at the feature cross matrix, it is basically the identity matrix skewed by a one over D factor. <coughs> Sorry, and this is basically the strongest possible coverage assumption you can make, um, you know, if you assume the features to be bounded, uh, have bounded norm. And what we show under the super strong coverage assumption is that even you assume this coverage assumption and also realizability, there are some harness, uh, hard instance, hard MDPs, so that no matter which algorithm you use, no matter which policy you want to evaluate for this MDP, you always suffer from this exponential sample complex lower bound. Okay, so this means like, you know, this is really pessimistic, showing that, you know, this is an information that lower bound, you cannot, you know, use algorithm, any algorithm to avoid the issue of geometric amplification. Okay, so uh, this is like, you know, our main harness result, and I would like to actually make a few remarks about uh, this result. So, you know, in our construction, um, the state space is polynomial large, and you only have actually two actions. And well, it was first true in the finite horizon setting, but you know, you can easily exact to the discounted case 
just to prove like exponential lower bound, exponential in basically one over one minus gamma in the effective dimension, uh, sorry, effective planning horizon. And there's an independent work by Zenit shows that in the discounted case, um, if you choose like exponential size state space and you, you even with stronger data distribution assumptions, this exponential lower bound still holds. So, I mean, I, I think this is a talk like uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, yeah, and uh, also like, you know, there's a follow-up work shows that in the discounted case, you know, actually by Nan and his students, uh, shows that in the discounted case, um, if, if you can assume similar this data distribution assumption as us, like the current assumption, even with just two states, infinite amount of data is insufficient for offline reinforcement to, for the problem of policy evaluation. And because like um, policy evaluation is easier than policy organization, um, similar role bound also holds for offline policy organization. And this also implies um, an exponential separation between offline reinforced learning and supervised learning as I said earlier, like, you know, under the realizability and the coverage assumption, supervised learning is doable. Like you can just draw these squares and things will work. But often for offline policy reinforced learning, algorithm, any algorithm suffers from such exponential uh, lower bound, basically the issue of geometric amplification. Okay, so yeah, basically this is um, the harness result we have. And like, um, so yeah, this is the general part. And now the question is like, we show some harness result. Um, how serious is this hardness result in practice? Like, you know, if I look at instances in practice, do they really suffer from such hardness result? Or do they have some magical properties that avoid this issue of geometric application? So the problem is really like, you know, do real life features satisfy some stronger recognition conditions other than realizability? Or if this is wrong, does this is saying like maybe, you know, um, offline reinforced learning is effectively is effective only when distribution is low. So we want to figure out like, you know, what, you know, for, you know, which happens, you know, in this two case for practical problems. And yeah, so, you know, this is the second part of this talk where basically we ask a question that are features in practice good enough? Um, yeah, and I should mention that this is a joint work, a very recent uh, work with uh, Yifan Wu, he is a PhD student at CMU, um, my advisor, Rasen Sakudinov, and Sham, you know, you all know him like uh, from uh, UW and Microsoft Research. So yeah, so this is uh, the second part of this talk. Um, okay, so yeah, so um, let me first uh, introduce our experimental methodology. But before doing that, let me again stress the point of doing these experiments. We want to know whether features in practice have nice properties, or the um, you know offline reinforced learning is effective only when you have low distribution shift. So to do that, we first need to find a policy, good policy, and a good reputation. So how do we do that? Well, it's actually very simple. Let's just run online reinforcement algorithm, like DQN, TD3, these deep RL methods, and we find a target policy and a good reputation. So what are the target policy? We just use the final policy output by DQN or TD3, these uh, DRL methods. And you have a good policy. What would be a nice feature for this policy? Why don't we just use um, the features output by the learn Q network. So suppose this is the final Q network in DQN. We just remove the output layer of this new network. And now we have the features. This should be a good feature for the policy. I mean, it clearly satisfies realizability. And in the context of supervised learning, these features are super effective. Like you can easily transfer features learned on one task to the other. So I mean, at least for supervised learning, this is what people expect, what the good features to be. But what happens for offline reinforced learning? Hold on, Russell. Like, so what realizability are we talking about? Realizability of Q star? Um, oh, the policy, you know, this is policy evaluation. Oh, policy evaluation. Because, you know, yeah, like product policy, like we want to evaluate the policy output by DQ and not TD3. Yeah, maybe I missed it. What's the rationale? What's the reason behind believing that this satisfies realizability? Um, I mean, because, you know, uh, in DQN, we basically use the Q network to define the policy, right? Like, you know, suppose you have the Q network basically out for the graded policy with respect to the Q. Right. Policy. So, and you but, use the same network and you would... Yeah, exactly. This is basically the final Q network of DQN. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, and, you know, I, 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 I see the intuition, but I don't think there is a bulletproof sort of yeah, argument. Like, you know, I, I understand. Yes. Okay. Okay. Cool. So basically, 
this is the representation and uh, like we have a good target policy. And uh, now we want to create some data distribution with distribution shape. How do we do that? Let's um, do the following. So we first collect 1 million samples using the target policy itself. We just draw out this policy and collect 1 million samples. I mean, this is really a data set with no distribution shape at all. And we should be expecting this data set to be super effective. Like this basically belongs to the case where you have low distribution shape. And now we combine this um, one million sample sample from uh, the poly itself, basically D star, with random trajectories um, or like you know trajectories from lower performing policies. Okay, so basically like we create another policy mixed uh, this target policy with um, like other policies, like you know random policies or policies from like you know like worse policies. And now we have this data set. We just run offline methods, and guess what happens? Okay, so yeah, let me uh, illustrate uh, what happens like for tough data. Basically, what I said is like, let's use random policy and this target policy to generate some, you know, a data set. And I also gave you basically the QNet work, uh, you know, output by DQN except for last layer. And we use offline re of reinforcement algorithm to evaluate this um, policy. So guess what happens? And uh, okay, so this is what happens. Basically, um, you know, this blue line corresponds to the case where you just have samples from um, the target policy itself. And I guess this also answers your question. And like, you know, you can see that eventually the error goes to super small, right? And okay, so as we add more samples from random trajectories, you can see that the estimation error of, you know, this is results for FQI, it is becoming worse. So this is showing that, you know, the performance of Offline reinforced learning could be sensitive to distribution shift. And this, this is actually holds for a large variety of environments. Like for this is carpool, this is hopper, some Mojoko environments, and also like for mountain cloud, the same thing will hold. Okay, so basically this shows that at least for mixing random trajectories with uh, target policy itself, FQI offline reinforced learning is not really um, robust to distribution shift. Okay, so let's um, do some other experiments. Like uh, now, this time, let's use lower performing policies instead of. Oh, sorry, it's not running. Um, let's use lower performing policies instead of random policies. So you can see that now we combine this target policy, which is running pretty well, um, together with a lower performing policy. Like basically, this one is kept by early stop uh, of uh, DQ, DIL methods. Like, uh, you know, so this is a lower performing policy. It is not running that well, but it, it's okay. And we use these two policies um, uh, to generate the data set. And also, I give you the new representation. And uh, um, we use, like, you know, offline R, like basically FQI to evaluate this target policy itself. So, you know, guess what happens? Um, you can see that things are even worse. So, basically, here we have four, actually, okay, so, you know, we have actually four different policies. Um, like Pi one is basically the worst one. Pi four is uh, sorry. Pi one is the best one. Pi four is the, is the worst one. Basically, all these uh, policies are get by early stopping like the RL methods. And I use you know again I collect one million samples by using uh, the policy itself, the target policy itself. And for each of these sub policies, I use them to collect one million samples. Okay. And basically, what happens here is that you know again adding samples from like some policies will hurt the performance. And also you can see that there will really be geometric application, like, you know, for this green line and the uh, orange line, as you run more runs of FQI, things are exploding. And again, this holds for like a large variety of uh, environments, like basically for this module environments, carpool, mountain car, the same thing also happens. And, you know, in most cases we have this geometric application. Okay, so, um, yeah, so like, uh, uh, hey, Rosal, there's a clarification question from Kamir is so some of the environments you showed, it seems like half cheetah, which seems to be a continuous action domain. Oh, yeah, uh, that's the reason why we why I said like DQ and, and a TD3, like TD3. Is oh, like, I see, I see. TD3 yeah, like, is you know, for the so continuous TD3. action, makes sense. Yes, yeah, like you know, for this uh, uh, actual creative method, basically, I use the critic. Um, to you know, as the QNet fork of the pods. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if we should discuss it now, but uh, Chaba mentioned that uh, 
the Google Brain uh, team has a paper called Optimistic Perspective on uh, Offline RL. This is by uh, Dell and others. Uh, we can discuss later how to oh, yeah, reconcile yeah, these two videos. Yeah, after yeah. OK, thanks. Um, OK, so yeah, so uh, OK. So the final question is like, you know, um, are these results really shed some, shedding, sh shedding some lights on the problem of policy, uh, sorry, policy organization? So actually, we um, provide another set of results where we basically also ask a question that can FQI compare policies? We have four seven policies for each of these environments. Um, like basically the second number here is the gap between the target policy and the um, sum of policy. And we also uh, write down the root mean squared error of the estimation of FQI on the data set generated by the target policy and the sum of policy. Basically, you know, again, the same uh, setting before. And, and uh, you know, basically, again, like the first number is the estimation error, second number is the um, gap of the policy. And we see, you know, FQI can do the comparison if the estimation error is smaller than the gap, because otherwise it's hard to say like what it is doing, right? So what you can see that for these uh, environments, for most uh, cases, FQI cannot really distinguish between uh, the target policy and some policy. Okay, so yeah, let me make some observations about the experimental results. So this is what we showed is like adding more data, either from random trajectories or lower performing policies into the data set, it generally hurts the performance. And uh, I mean, we also perform experiments on like you know, temporal difference algorithm like LSTD, and we also try other features like random Fourier features, basically the same trend holds for all of them. And this shows that, um, um, yeah, so like, uh, you know, this basically shows that performance of like offline reinforcement methods could be sensitive to this shape. And in some cases, we do see geometric application uh, predicted by the worst case, like theoretical analysis. And it, it seems that at least for pre-trained neural features, they do not see to satisfy those strong like reference conditions that were previously made in the literature. Okay, so yeah, so what would be the uh, message here? Um, so I guess the main message of this whole talk is like, uh, for supervised learning and the offline reinforced learning, the definition of good reputation could be really different. Like the definition of good reputation in offline reinforced learning is much more subtle in supervised learning because in supervised learning, we know that if you have realizability, in most cases things will just work. Um, but for like you know on offline reinforced learning, we know that kind of like we require those stronger reputation conditions to make things to work. And also for like these experiments, we see that you know. Um, like these pre-trained neural features, which should be good for supervised learning, they are not that effective for offline reinforced learning. So maybe we can improve the performance of offline reinforced learning algorithms by opening up the black box of deep learning. Like maybe we can design some new methods in like you know learning feature, a feature learning process, you know that is better fit for like you know the goal of offline reinforcement or reinforced learning. And for theory, I guess, like, you know, they suggest that we should maybe rely on more realistic assumptions. Like, you know, we, 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 now we understand that realizability is not really sufficient and companies, it may not satisfy in practice. Is there anything between these two assumptions? And, uh, you know, and also like, you know, we should have better ideas what happens with real life features, like what kinds of structural um, conditions they satisfy and use them to prove like, you know, new theory bounds. And for practice, we know that the performance of offline reinforced learning could be um, sensitive to distribution shift. And uh, this suggests that you know, when doing empirical comparisons, we should come up benchmark suits so that the data set may not satisfy this low different shift, but do does have coverage. So can we come up with you know better benchmark suits? Because you know, I'm asking this because like basically all empirical works, they are performing experiments on data sets as I what I use, like basically a combination of good policies and worse, like bad, like worse policies, like random policies or lower performing policies. And you know, it's hard to say whether you know these data sets really have like no distribution shift or coverage, right? So, is there any way to design a better data set so that we does have coverage but do not have, um, you know, we do not have low distribution shift? And also, like you know, this is like I said, this you know the experimental part is like new results. Uh, so yeah, please have a look at our paper for more implications on. Of other things like theory and practice. And yeah, so thanks for coming to this talk again, and I will take some questions. Uh, there's a clarification, 
there's a question about the empirical detail uh, that we missed that uh, asks uh, what were in the empirical evaluations, what were the dimension of the feature vector taken in, re in relation to the input sample dimensions? Oh, um, uh, basically we just use uh, whatever people use for like, you know, the online reinforcement algorithm. Basically, like basically the width of the new network is the dimensionality of the features. Mm -hmm. Like the number of neurons you have in the last hidden layer. It's mm -hmm. usually something like a few hundreds. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other question uh, or comment I have is for benchmarks. I'm actually not sure to what extent developing data sets with better coverage uh, is the way to go because to what extent do we expect that in real world applications, we will always have coverage? I, I, or I mean, like in for training, I think a significant portion of recent interest in offline RL is precisely to devise algorithms that works when there's no coverage or there's a lack of coverage. Yeah, right? I, I guess you're saying there is no distribution shape, low distribution shape, right? I think this would be shape or, mm, Yeah, but maybe that's one way to put it because, you know, maybe people will just to train their policy to be close to the behavior policy so that when you evaluate them, you win the low distribution shift um, setting. Yeah, I guess like, you know, most empirical works, like they basically put like, um, uh, use like being pessimistic, basically you, Minus like the the confidence interval, like you basically do uh, certain quantification and you do you you do things like in a pessimistic manner, right? So yeah, I think you know this is again in the uh, regime where we want to force the learned policy to be close to the um, like the underlying distribution, right? So I think this is still like in the sense like we want to learn a policy that is close. I mean, this is not really the case where we want often reinforcement work because like, you know, the diverse, the, the source of the data could be super diverse. Like we can have different policies that generate the data. We don't really understand what happens in this data set, right? So I guess, you know, um, yeah. So, you know, it's, you know, as I said, it's pretty hard to argue what is the real definition of courage. At least I think, you know, we should not just focus on data set with loaded machine. I guess that is basically the point yeah. I'm making here. So there are a few raised hands to so gurgle raised uh, recently. There was a hand that was up for quite some time. Uh, Christos uh, Demetrakis, are you still there? Uh, do you still want to ask your question? I think I was I pressed it by mistake. Uh, but oh, okay. I really like your I really like your talk. It was really nice. Um, I just had a general question actually. Now the raised my hand by mistake. Um, can you kind of uh, reconcile a little bit this discussion you had? Uh, with the earlier results by, by Munoz and their assumptions uh, regarding concentrability and so on. Completeness? Yeah. No, I think uh, he, he was talking about concentrability. Oh, concentrability, yeah. okay. Yeah. How strong is that compared to the realizability? Yeah, like, you know, the concentrability, I think it's the concentrability, anyways. Yeah, it's the concentrability assumption. Basically, says that there are some worst case density ratio bounds um, on the, uh, you know, on the data, on the data distribution and the distribution induced by policies. So I think this is, you know, better for the case where you do not have any structured um, features. Like, you know, for the case of linear uh, functional approximation, we have the features, we can really measure the coverage in a better way. Like basically look at the feature course metrics and see, you know, how many directions can be covered by the features, right? So you know that's the reason why you know in this paper we adopt the um, uh, the uh, coverage assumption defined here. But you know for like other like unstructured function uh, function classes, it's really hard to define um, what is really um, the correct like coverage assumption. So you know I guess that's the reason why they use like these worst case density ratios at the uh, coverage assumption. Okay, then I guess Kurgo. <laughs> Right. So thanks for the talk, Rosong. I have a I have a question that is like maybe predictable given my agenda and views and all of these things. So maybe this kind of geometric error amplification that you see uh, associated with these methods, maybe this is the result of using the squared loss for um, for evaluating your policies and using these recursive methods, these recursive least squares 
or evaluating these methods. And maybe this property that you see is like not really capturing like fundamental limitations of reinforcement learning with offline data, but rather fundamental limitations of these methods um, um, that are based on based on a squared loss. So what is your take on this? I wonder. Like so, the harness result here is not actually just true for um, like. Algorithm with a square loss. This is information theoretic. So basically, any algorithm will suffer from exponential sum complexity. So yes, as you said, like you know, maybe there are other algorithms that can avoid like you know the errors be geometrically amplified, but it must have some other issues like kind of causes this like exponential overpower. So you know that's the reason. And also, but I do agree that you know for some cases, like you know other like loss functions could be useful. You know, one case I can think about is like you know um, for like planning, like where you want to find a good policy, it could be useful that, you know, instead of using the D squares estimator, we use some robust version of the estimator because of the bias induced by the Bellman operator to handle that. So yeah, like, you know, I, I think that my takeaway is like for planning questions, um, it, it might be better to use like other uh, estimators, but, you know, for policy evaluation, I think, you know, basically every algorithm will suffer from the same exponential sum complex lower. Bar. So, you know, in the worst case, you cannot really improve any of these uh, results. Right? Right, so that's a, that's really a great answer regarding uh, the the theoretical limitations. But like, what would you say about like the practical setup? I mean, would you really think that uh, maybe this kind of like really bad results that you're seeing for these DKNs, maybe these can be avoided by the methods? I think this really depends on the environment, like and also the data that you use. Like basically, what we see in our experiments is like for different environments, like different algorithms could have like different problems. I mean, like you know into really understand what happens in your own environment to kind of choose the best estimator for these things. Okay. Right. Yeah, so uh, uh, I think, uh, so Rosal and also Sham in the chat raised a good point that uh, the current uh, RL benchmark, they often form like foster the data set by mixing the good policy with some like random trajectories, which, you know, is really like essentially like imitation learning plus uh, some extra data. So uh now there like recently there has been some benchmarks that has been widely used in practice especially so there's one mentioned in the chat rl unplug there's also the default rl data set Roson, do you know like uh, is that issue somewhat serious in these widely used benchmarks or uh like do you have experience with them actually um i'm pretty familiar with the default rl data set i think Basically, the way they are generating the data set is pretty close to what I did in this talk. Basically, they are still like using the replay buffer of good algorithm or just using like a trajectory sampled by normal performing policies or expert policies and mix them with something. So basically, like at least for default IL, I think basically they still suffer from these issues. Um, so I mean, I'm not saying like these are not great benchmarks. It's just like we might also need benchmarks so that you know there is no like low distribution shift condition, right? Yeah. Right. Uh, then there's the question of, does the policy value gap closely depend on the discount factor? Uh, Kiman, do you want to maybe elaborate more on your question? Or if Rosong, you understand what the question is about? Um, I guess it's better for him to... Um, yeah, clarify the question. Sorry for that. Hello, do you hear me? Oh, yeah. Yes, yes we do hear you. Uh, yes, I just would like to know uh, when you change, I mean, uh, in the results, uh, what is the, maybe you choose some particular value of discount factor, and I wonder if uh, this, the val its value change, uh, whether the gaps uh, change as well. I mean, uh, if the discount factor is very, uh, is a little bit small and you converge very fast. So, uh, uh, oh, I see. So, um, so as I said, like, you know, uh, this, uh, practical algorithm, they basically always set a discount factor to be 0 0.9 for some reasons. Basically, I guess this is for better, like hyper point tuning, but, uh, yeah. So like, we didn't really try like other discount factor basically because like, you know, if you set discount factor to be some, say something like 0 0.9, I guess now this online reinforcement could work. So it's really hard to define what a good reputation. So yeah, that's basically the reason why we set discount factor here. But you know, yeah, we can have like you know more comparisons like for these different discount factors. Yes, yeah, thanks for the uh, suggestion. Like, but you know, 
At this point, we didn't really run experiments for other discount factors. But you know, like we basically adopt the default discount factors that people are using in practice. So I guess it's um, like a fairer thing to use. Okay, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, actually, I have a question. So, so I, I think one interesting empirical or, or one interesting thing to reconcile between empirical and uh, theoretical works is to understand, uh, so maybe this is part of the conclusion of your uh, uh, experiments and I missed it. Do we know if these real uh, actual representation is learned in, uh, with deeper networks? Do they have low inherent Bel Bellman error or the inherent Bellman error is large? Like I I'm referring to this uh, completeness or a closedness assumption. Yeah, so I guess verifying the completeness assumption for the new language itself is super hard. Like we, really, difficult. this yeah. is hard, but you know, that's the reason why we choose to work in a linear setting. Because right. In a linear setting, everything is simple. There's no like those kind of non-convex optimization things you know, things are transparent. That's basically the reason why we are verifying this practical feature satisfy companies or not. But, you know, from our experiments, I think it's pretty clear that, you know, at least the features learned by new networks do not satisfy companies. For the question of why the new, net, new networks some, themselves satisfy companies, I think yeah. nobody knows. Like, it's super hard to compute. Right, right, right. The, I don't agree. Uh, so so that, that's where I want to peek into a little bit, because uh, because maybe I was paying attention to questions, so I only get a high level picture of, of your experiments. It seems like you show that, you know, the using those features with off policy data, uh, like the, the errors uh, are, are pretty bad. But having bad errors uh, can, there can be many reasons or many factors that go into that bad performance, right? Uh, like, as you said, there's uh, distribution shift issues, maybe completeness being broken is part of it. But did you have like ablation study that's actually paying us down or have more precise results that show you, yes, completeness is completely broken, that we can um, I guess, be very confident. Again, like we don't really know how to verify completeness is broken. So like basically- I, I mean, but even for even for linear case, we don't know. I, I think can so you run some mini max? I don't know, like. I guess, you know, my take is like, there's no probably ways to verify the gap. So that's basically the reason why we, control the level of distribution shift in this condition. So basically, yeah, so let me go back to this one. Here, we basically control the level of distribution shift, like number of data points come from random trajectories. And you know, you can see that basically here, like when there's no distribution shift, it is pretty good. And as you add more random trajectories, it's bad. So, you know, as I said, like, you know, if you have like complaints, you know, offline reinforcement should, should still be working even if you have some shift. So this is kind of the implication. So I guess, you know, that's the reason why we um, verify this in, uh, indirect manner because like we don't really know right, how right. to solve that problem. Yeah, like... Uh, yeah, I was yeah. just thinking that with linear, I mean, it seems like you can write down something like a minimax objective and if you have completeness, that objective should close to zero, but maybe even for linear, that minimax objective can be Challenging. Like kind of like, yeah, hard I, I'm hard. referring to the like the paper by uh, Antosh uh, Chaba Rumi. Like, I think you know the paper I'm talking. Yeah, about. yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, so, Sham, you had a hand up uh, a few minutes ago. Do you still want to make a comment? Uh, no, this was just uh, clarifying a point in the chat. So, I, okay, uh, I'll let you your drive. Okay, so there's a. Uh, how there's a question how is it uh, possible that adding random trajectories did not blow up the error but adding suboptimal trajectories blew it up am i missing something here oh, I think you are saying like yeah. either this one have, does not have geometric application but uh, this one has is, is that the question mm, yes maybe yeah um like i guess the short answer is like, I don't know. Like, uh, you know, I really, <laughs> yeah, this one is also kind of amazing to me. I mean, like when I'm doing the experiments, like I was thinking, you know, things will be exploding, but not at such a fast rate. So yeah, so like maybe, you know, I guess like, you know, next version, maybe we can plot like the eigenvalues of the IL matrices to see that if that's like, you know, for different data set, the IL matrix is really different. Some of them are uh, expensive, some of them are not. 
So this might be kind of a reason, but you know, it's very hard to explain why you know certain matrices satisfy some things. But you know, so but for one of um, these experiments, I can say something. At least for this mountain car case, basically, I think about what happens with a random policy for mountain car. It's basically just uh, you know, like basically it's like a stable, uh, like you know, static point because like you know, if you not go a lot of running mountain car with a random policy, so basically you are just adding a new data, but with many copies into the data set. That could be reason. So this is not really such a bad data set. You're just like you know multiple up, up copies of a single data point. For other ones, I guess you know for some of them, this could be the reason. Like basically because you know if you look at this um, uh, random policy for half cheetah, it is basically like not like moving a lot, right? And it compared to these like better policies. So I guess that could be one of the reason. But uh, you know a more direct way to see this is just by plotting the L matrix and see what happens. This is. Um. Okay, I, I think I've cleared uh, most of the asked questions. Uh, if anyone wants to ask for the questions or make comments, maybe you can directly speak up. Uh, Rosa, do you want to comment on the thing that Chaba brought well, I didn't up? Really the... track the task oh, I didn't I was tracking it, so it's fine. Uh, okay. the, this uh, optimistic perspective on on offline RL papers <laughs> by by Del Schumann and others. Sorry, well, there was a question I didn't really. Um, I think it's more general, like. Oh, but maybe I we think... can like kind of discuss that in the discussion. Um, yeah, sure. So I was wondering if you were gonna elaborate on the lower band construction, like explain. What is going on there? Do we have any slides regarding that? Um, I guess like we have really nice figure in the paper itself. Like you just look at the paper and you understand what happens. Basically, um, I can say that in one or two sentences, it's just saying it's something like, okay, so all the rewards you are seeing, they are close to zero. Like the mean is close to zero. The pol and the value of policy is basically um like basically the reward value are fueled by the expensive factor. So you look at you cannot really get any useful information because the mean is so small, like the ratio between noise and information is so small, you cannot really get any good estimation. But suppose you have like tiny amount of estimation error on the reward, your estimation, your estimation on the policy, your estimation error on the policy is huge because that is amplified by the exponential factor. So, you know, um, so yeah, so the main like technical thing in the lower bound is like how do we construct the case where you know, this can happen. Like you can just see rewards with small values and things are amplified. And yeah, for that, I guess you need to have a look at the paper, like the construction. I guarantee you, this is really simple. You just look at the picture and see what happens. Okay, I see. Thank you. So I have another question just for the understanding. Uh, the, uh, you calculate the policy value gap so uh, yes. it is the difference between the value function, but uh, the difference between the value function, do you use which norm, L1 norm or L2? Oh, oh. Uh, value function is basically the value you get by starting, by rolling out the policy from the initial state. It's just like a scalar. Like the value function is basically what's the like expected cumulative reward you will, re you will get by using the policy. Yes. It's, yeah, it's just a number. Yeah, but so you compare. Oh, but you're saying like the estimation error, like we use the square, um, like means uh, square root of the mean squared error of the estimation. So yeah, the mirroring the uh, the the error we use like square error. Okay, okay, I see. 